Today, we're going to show you some principles about heat. First demonstration is with this candle. This candle starts off as potential energy. There is potential energy in the chemical bonds between the hydrogen and the carbon in the wax molecules. And we're going to use that potential energy to create heat energy. So the first step, when we bring over the light over to the candle, it doesn't light. Why doesn't it not light immediately? Well, what do we need? We need oxygen from the air. We need fuel, which is the candle. We need heat from the spark unit, or the heat unit. And then we can create fire. So we have all three components we just added in here, but we did not create the actual fire. So what do we really need? There's one more step that's missing from the fire triangle. In this candle, which is solid wax, we need to create a fuel that is in gas form. So the first thing we need to do is melt the solid wax, which then turns liquid in the wick. And then from the liquid in the wick, we have to heat that up to form gas wax molecules that are coming off the wick. And then they, the gas molecules of the candle, combine with the oxygen in the air, and then we can get combustion. So that's why you must hold the, the lighter next to the wick just a couple seconds to have this gas to liquid occur before you start. So now if we do that, we can go ahead and hold it close just for a second or two, and then the candle will light. Notice the solid turns the liquid, turns the gas, which is ignited. Notice also that the light that we see, the colors that we get, are different from the center on out. So you have a different temperatures from the light. The other thing we want to show you is that the heat and the candle is all going up, not going sideways, not going down, but there's a rising, which shows you that the hot air generated here is less dense than the cold air around it. And so the hot air is rising as the other air is coming in. And that is called a draft, forming a draft for the candle for the heat. Now that we have ignition on the candle with the hot air rising, what happens when we blow out a candle? We are actually removing some of the oxygen and the heat from the source so that by removing the heat, then you stop the fire. So let's do that and then watch what happens. Look at the rising smoke. These are particles. What particles are they? They're the wax that's as a gas. They're uncombusted, so the entire wax molecule is floating up into the air, and that's part of the smoke particulates. This demonstration shows you the thermal expansion and contraction of a gas. This demo is about heating air. This bottle is full of air. Now air is 99% nitrogen and oxygen. The air molecules in the bottle are moving around creating something called pressure. These molecules have kinetic energy. Look what we can do. If you put the bottle in the cold water, you'll have less kinetic energy and the particles will move smaller. Notice how the volume becomes less. Now, when I move the bottle into the hot water, now the particles have more kinetic energy and they're bouncing around faster and the volume gets higher. In both of these cases, we are transferring energy from the hot water to the air in the container and transferring energy to the cold water. Once again, as you can notice, the molecules are bouncing around slower and exerting less pressure on the walls of the container and the volume becomes less. This is a repeatable process. So now we have a small volume, put it into the hot water and the molecules move faster 
the pressure goes up and the volume gets bigger. Now we know that gases can expand and contract with temperature, but can solids? Check it out. In my hands are two metal objects. They're made of brass. The ball fits snugly through the ring. They're both at room temperature. But look what happens when I heat up the ball with the torch. Now when you heat up a solid, the molecules move faster and faster, start to vibrate, and they expand. The ball no longer can fit through the ring because the atoms have expanded and it is now too large. Now the ball and the ring are back to room temperature. Notice they fit together. But can I do something to the ring? Sure. If I were to chill the ring, it will make the ring smaller. The atoms of metal get closer together and they vibrate less. So let's leave it in the ice just a few seconds. We'll take it out and the ball will no longer fit through the ring. When we want to boil water, we put on a flame, which is methane gas, igniting, combusting, and from the potential chem chemical energy, we're then creating heat, and that heat is warming up the metal, and so we are transferring the heat energy from the flames and the air to the metal, and from the metal to the water. And this is all transference of heat by increasing the vibration of atoms. So we start with a flame of heat, which goes to hot metal, and eventually goes to a boiling water on the inside, which then is used to help cook the food. This is the volcano demonstration. We have fairly hot water near boiling in here. Ooh, that is hot. Ooh. And then we have two straws. One is down lower than the other, but they're the same length, just the different heights, the lower straw and a taller straw. And because they, the, this water is in glass, it has a high density compared to regular water. So when I lift this up and put this in, nice and slow, the jar sinks because it is more dense than the water. And then immediately, you'll see it forms the volcano. You have the cold water, which is more dense, coming down the straw into the bottom, which as you can see is now clear as the cold water is entering the container. The hot water is being pushed out because the force of gravity is pulling the denser water down, the colder water down. Hot water is being pushed out and it rises up through the cold water because it's less dense and you see that it is forming a layer on the top. Notice that the red stream is coming up and it does not immediately mix. It has a different density and water will mix slowly which with the molecules bouncing off each other. It's called Brownian motion and they'll mix a little bit but it's not really that much. So the water rises and is less dense and even up here, now even after a minute or two, the hot water, or warmer water, the red water, is staying unmixed in the colder or dense water down below. And this is a mimic for the oceans, which is also happening where the hot water is above the colder water. This is the albedo experiment showing a, what radiation can do to the temperature of objects of different colors. In this can, which is black, which absorbs energy, but this can is white, which re reflects energy. Both cans are empty, just air on the inside, not water, not, not other substances. They are both at room temperatures, and you can see 
that is at 27 degrees and 27 degrees Celsius, both cans, same temperature at the start. The light, which is a 60 watt light bulb, which I'm going to turn on here in a second, represents the sunlight coming in as the radiation is being sent to the land, black, or the ice, the white, or even the clouds, the white. So here we go. The cans are both equidistant from the light, so there should be no difference there in the temperatures. I can place them nice and nice, a little bit closer. At the moment, the temperatures are pretty stable for the moment, and this may take a couple minutes. The temperature now, after just three minutes, in the black is 29 degrees, and in the white, 28 degrees. It has now been five minutes. The temperature in the black can is now up to 32, almost 33, it's rising. And then the white can is just hitting 30 degrees now. So now there's a three degree difference between the cans, and the black can is continuing to rise, looks like a little bit faster than the white can. Okay, so while we're watching the temperatures rise, this also is mimicking other features of the Earth, black land, and the white is either clouds or ice. Now as the radiation comes in, this is called differential heating, and so that can influence the air temperatures, but we can also look at the albedo of the clouds. Now global warming, the water warms up and makes more clouds, we'll get more albedo effect. But if the ice melts on the polar caps, reducing the amount of white on Earth, will be increasing the temperature of Earth. So these two factors, the clouds and the ice, are sort of balancing each other at the moment. But if we lose all the ice on the ocean, then, uh, then we'll just have the clouds to protect us. And then it may get out of balance after that. We are now at about 10 minutes into the experiment. And we're now, the temperature of the black can is continuing to rise. It's now at 40 degrees Celsius, whereas the white can is at 34 degrees, a six degree difference. So the black can is continuing to rise faster and faster compared to the white can. This demonstration is about specific heat. Now, specific heat is the amount of energy it takes to warm something up. On Earth, we have land and water. It takes much, much more energy to warm up water than it does to warm up land. So here's our setup. We've got a heat lamp, which uh, mimics the sun. We have one container of water, which acts like our oceans. And we have another container of sand, it's dry sand, that acts like the continents. Now before we start the experiment, let's check the temperatures. The tabletop has got a temperature of 25 degrees C, represents a white surface. The water has a temperature of 23 degrees C, that represents oceans. The sand has a temperature of 24 degrees C, and that represents dry land. Now let's see what happens when we turn on the light. So now the sun's out. This is a 150 watt heat lamp, and we are warming up the planet. The temperature on the tabletop is 39 degrees C. Whoa, now it's 40 already. The temperature in the water is 30 degrees C. And the temperature on land is 35 degrees C. So as you can see, um, the land is heating up much more quickly than the water. Let's wait about a minute and see what happens. So what's going on here is the sun is warming up the surface of the water slowly and that heat is penetrating the water very slowly because the specific heat of water is very high. Um, the land, on the other hand, is warming up very, very quickly. The deeper you go, it gets cooler, but the surface of the land is warming up very, very quickly. And the reflective surface, the white surface, does not warm up very much at all because the temperature is staying about the same and the energy is being reflected. Now we're going to turn the lights off representing sunset and measure the temperatures again. The 
the temperature of the water is at 35 degrees C. The temperature of the land is a whopping 48 degrees C. And now, now it's dropping about yeah, 40 degrees C. And the temperature of the white surface is about 38 degrees C. So as we were saying before, the water takes a long time to warm up, so 34 degrees C, and the land much faster, 42 degrees C. The purpose of insulation, such as styrofoam cups, is to reduce or make a barrier between the energy transfers. And this could be a convection or conduction that we're preventing from happening. So an example, we have hot water in the pan, which the temperature is 59 degrees. Okay, and then we're going to put it into three containers. So we have a glass container, we're going to have just a double insulation of styrofoam, and then we're going to have a double layer of styrofoam with a lid on it. So we have glass, an insulation from conduction, and then an insulation from, in addition to that from convection. So here we go. And the temperature of the water again was? 59 degrees. I'm going to have to do it this way. So I'm going to take 100 milliliters in of water, the same temperature, and put it into the three containers. One, two, more in there, and three. That's 100. So we have the same quantity of water at the same temperature at the start. 41. Okay, that's, hang on, that's 56, and this water is 52, 53. Now it's been about five minutes. Let's check our temperatures. The glass is about 46. The insulated cup is 49. And the insulated cup with the lid is 51.